Welcome to River Foursquare. Today we are getting ready to learn more about what's happening in the book of Acts. Before we do, we'd like to invite those of you who are with us for the first time to go on to our riverfoursquare.org and click that connect tab and let us know more about who you are. And if you are joining us on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we'd love to invite you to come into our virtual community. We believe in community here at River and we do everything together. So we have small community groups meeting in the Seattle area as well as our online community. And this morning, if it's 10 a.m., join us on Facebook. Click that connect button that's in the comments and uh, Google Meet re link. And you can join us there and have discussion because we build discussion questions into our um, service times because that's important for us to have talk, be together. Because discipleship happens in community. Absolutely. You can't be discipled by yourself. No. It doesn't work. It's never no. happened all 2,000 years of the church existence. So when it's not going to start now. Exactly. Discipleship happens in community. So be yes. a part of a community. Yeah. Uh, we also have our Halloween outreach coming up in our different communities that are local here. And we need candy. So if you are part of a community, bring your community candy. If you're not part of a community and you're local, bring candy. Bring candy to a community and come join us and be part of a community uh, so that we can, again, reach out to our neighbors and our friends. I know COVID's got it different, but I know like in our neighborhood, there's still a lot of people that are planning on going trick or treating and setting up social distanced fun activities and we're going to do the same thing uh, just because it's a time to connect and reach out and get to know one another again and that's again a value that we have here finally if you're part of river we invite you to continue giving your tithes and offerings that can make these types of events happen and you can do that at riverfoursquare.org click on that give tab or text 84321 to give us a text Text to give. Text to give, yes. So, Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you that your word is alive and that it gives us things to live our life by so that we can be more like you and share you with others and get through this life. And we just thank you right now that you are in us and through us, that the words that we speak are those from your Holy Spirit and no other voice do we listen to today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week... <coughs> We talked about uh, conviction, obedience, that we as believers, by definition, are people of conviction, that there are, there are absolute truths, that believers' relativism or <laughs> your personal truth has no place as a Christian. Um, it, no, because Scripture has laid down what truth is, an absolute truth. Um, this, all of Scripture is full of absolute truth. And that's what we as believers go by. And when we're convinced by those absolute truth, it causes us to, or let me rephrase this, it causes action. We have to act upon it. If we believe it, we do something in accordance to it, right? So that's who we are as believers. So this last week, <laughs> as you went about uh, life, or whatever form that looked like, uh, what truths, what absolute truths stood out to you this week? Um, how do they affect your choices? Were you aware of the, well, what were absolute truths and what were man's truths? Were you aware of the difference and did you see them? Let's talk about that.
We're in Acts chapter 5 still, the last part of Acts chapter 5. And I want to talk about is what do we do when we face adversity? What do we do when there's obstacles and things that show up in our path? How do we handle that? How do we process it? Because the disciples here, that's what they're dealing with. Really, the rest of the book of Acts, they're dealing with obstacles to them doing what God has called them to do. And we in our lives, as we face the same kind of thing. So let's dive into here. Acts chapter 5, verse oh, 32. Here we go. And actually, before we do that, quick backstory. So they were preaching in the temple. They were arrested. An angel broke them out of jail in the middle of the night who told them to go back to the temple. They went back to the temple. They got pulled back aside, and now they're talking to the uh, council of Jewish leaders, Sadducees and Pharisees, mostly Pharisees. So here we go. And we are witness to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they, were, they would be the council. When the council heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Glamel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to the men to be put outside for a little while. And he said, and he goes, men of Israel, take care what you're about to do to these men. For before these days, Theus, or Thedus, whatever, make up your own word, rose up, claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400 of them, joined him. And he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And afterwards, a guy named Judas, the Galileans, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So I present this case to you. Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if they were... For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it'll fail anyway. But it's, if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, and you might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they called the disciples in, they beat them, charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. And then they left the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer honor for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus, or that, that, that the Christ is Jesus. All right. In this council, talking everything else. And they're hashing up. Literally, they want to stone them. Right. They want them dead. They want to throw they're rocks done. at them until they die. Right. That's what's going on here. And this guy named Glamel, or Gamiel, a million of pronunciation, use your own, won't make a difference. I'm going to use Glamel because that's what I've always heard. So Glamel speaks up. And this guy is a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. He is the, he's the dude. He is so much the dude. He was Paul's teacher. Because as we're going to learn later on, as Paul was a Pharisee. And the guy who trained Paul to be a Pharisee was this guy. Glamel. And actually, when you were trained by him, it was actually a, it was a badge of honor. Right. Because this guy was so well respected. Yeah. And he, and so it's kind of like, when you know, if you've ever been in a, in a crew room or whatnot, when one guy speaks, everyone seems to stop and drop what they're doing. That's this guy. And so he speaks up and he, he basically says, hey, take these guys, put them outside. <laughs> Go run along from now. Go look busy, right? So they get taken outside. They get put in the little kid's timeout room. They get put aside, and he lays it out for him. He goes, now, and he lays out the story. He cites two other uh, instances, a guy named uh, Thaddeus and Judas. Um, Judas was a guy who led a result in a revolt in about 6 AD or so, and the other guy was prior to 6, but before 4 BC, so somewhere in there. And anyway, he basically points out this. He goes, if it's man's doing, it's going to fail and nothing's going to come of this. But then he also points out, he goes, but if it's of God, you could find yourself in a world of trouble. And basically tells them, even prior to that, he goes, don't do a thing to these guys. Either let it fizzle out or you're going to have a problem. And uh, it's funny, when Rosanna was talking about this, or we were t discussing a couple weeks ago, she read this, and, goes, and she goes, and they beat them. 
And, and literally, <laughs> they, they, they still they beat them. They decided not to kill them, but they still oh, beat, beat them. them. And they beat yeah. them. But in, in the end, so they, they were beaten. And so the, the beating was basically meant you, you were whipped up, up to 40 times. Uh, can't go over 40 because that was Jewish law. There was boundaries. Uh, so they, they, were, they were beaten with, with lashes, and they said they laughed, and they were rejoicing. And, and they were praising God. <laughs> and you think, what in the world is going on? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 11 to 12, Jesus is talking about this. Here's what Jesus says. He goes, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil ag against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For if they persecuted the prophets who were or sorry, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so this is this verse coming alive, that they know the words of Jesus. But this is exactly what's happening because they were persecuted because of Jesus. He goes, rejoice, because great is your reward. And they literally went rejoicing. Not only that, but even when they got out, it says they, they did not cease to teach every day in the temple and house to house. So literally, the beating didn't stop them. <laughs> it was as if... They, they ignored, well, act, let me rephrase this. It is, they ignored everything the Jewish religious, religious leader said then because they're like, should we obey God or should we obey man? You be the judge. And they pointed that out last week when we talked about that. And so this is a versity that's facing these guys, that's facing the church. And we, as believers, we've also faced adversity we've we've faced things that are going on and so it's that idea is is adversity is it a speed bump or is it a barricade right um, is it a speed bump or barricade nobody likes speed bumps except Especially the except the asphalt guys the asphalt guys and people who have no the, just asphalt well, guys. well there's somebody that wants them in place nobody wants speed bumps and actually, I, there are two different kinds of speed bumps. There's a good speed bump yes. and a bad. The bad speed bumps are like they're like really jolting, and then the good ones are like a smooth right. roll. Those are the ones that people put those speed bumps in. They care. Yeah, they care. But is or is adversity? Is it a speed bump or is it a barricade? I mean, a speed bump you can get over. It's a little jostling for a second, or you could roll over it. You might have to slow down for a second, or you can take them at speed. It won't really make a difference. You're going to get over the speed bump yeah. either way. And then there's the barricade. That's going to stop you, and you're not going to get through it. And the disciples here, it was just a speed bump. They rolled right over it. They're like, ah, just floor it. If we get air, we'll launch over the next one, right? They, they, they just took it. They just took it. It wasn't a barricade for them. Because you have to understand, the disciples, they were just doing what Jesus called them to do. They were just doing that. And it wasn't going smoothly. From the point of view, is they were doing it. They were seeing results, but they were being persecuted. And that's the part that wasn't going smoothly. And they were beaten. They were thrown in jail. They were threatened with their very lives. And at times, it was hard. But they dealt with it. They didn't quit. They didn't stop. They just kept going. As believers, how do we handle adversity? Speed bump or barricade? How do we handle adversity? The disciples are feeling that they're fulfilling the mission of Jesus to go preach in the temple. Literally, Jesus tells them flat out, or let me phrase this, the angel tells them, as soon as he broke them out, go back to the temple and teach. Specific instructions to do that. And they were treated poorly, but yet they rejoiced when they were beaten. They rejoiced. They're like, praise God. <laughs> praise God for the lashings, right? Beatings will continue until morale improves, right? They, they were, they were, they were like, thank God that we were kind of worthy because they're on a mission and they're fulfilling that mission. And they weren't going to let adversity stop them from doing what God has called them to do. And they were probably rejoicing they weren't dead. There was probably right? part of that too, but even God though it rescued, hurt. Right, it hurt. But God had saved them from what they thought was going to happen, which was being death. Well, not only that, but let's, let's, let's remember everything that happened here. So... In that last little sibit, right, they, they were beaten. Six hours prior to that, they were rescued from a jail by an angel. Six hours prior to that, 
massive amounts of being healed and delivered. Right? <laughs> this is this is this is tw- this little period of time. Maybe it was tw- only twenty four hours. Maybe it was a little further than that. But this just that just take that little twenty four hour snap it there. That's a good day. If it was only the beating that was the bump, that was a good day. And they're rejoicing. And so in our communion, so let's take a let's take a second of discussion here. Describe a time when you encountered adversity, and then God showed up. Right. Describe a time that you that you encountered adversity, an obstacle, a barrier, or a speed bump, and then God showed up. Let's talk about that. Jesus said there would be speed bumps along the way, but he also said he's overcome them. Right? In the world, you have trouble, but I've overcome the world. Don't sweat it. I got this. See, here's, here's the thing. 
our logical minds always want to make conclusions. Um, it's the problem with with Adam and Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is our intellect wants to be the boss. So our intellect comes with these logical conclusions. It looks at a sample of evidence, a series of circumstances, says if one plus one has to be two. It starts making math, starts doing calculations. It comes to observations. And our logical mind starts saying this. It starts saying this. Well, if we have obstacles and adversity, that means it must not be God's plan. Right. That God right. is placing these in my path. The doors are to, shut. To stop me. And the logical sequential mind also goes into the, it goes, it goes, oh, if there's no obstacles and no adversity, I must be doing what God has called me, me to do. I wish all that was the case, right? And so that's where we get into this pop culture theology. I do not like pop culture theology. And what I mean by pop culture theology is a series of theology that's based on cliches, not on scriptures. Here's one. God opens doors and closes other ones. What a load. I was a baby hand tap, right? What a load, right? That is, I don't know where we came up with that, right? God closes the door and opens doors. No, Right? We have to be careful of cliche theology. We have to be careful of pop culture theology because our ideas and concept of who God is has to be based on who he said he is, not on our logical sequential mind kind to come up with math to explain our circumstances because we don't understand because we haven't gone back to the Father yet to inquire what the situation is going on. Danger. We get danger in there, right? So here's the thing. Obstructions... Do not determine or convey God's will. So obstructions or lack of obstructions do not determine or convey God's will. Doesn't. They're just circumstances. Correct. And then we have They're just stuff. Yeah. They're just stuff. Stuff. Yep. Stuff happen. It does not convey God's will. Correct. Right? Because here's the thing is if we let obstacles and adversity to determine God's will, we're living, we basically, we go back and we're living in a time where we have to cast lots to determine God's will. We have to draw sticks. Well, I have three black sticks and one white stick. If I get the white stick, it means this. What is that? Actually, it's witchcraft. We digress. Um, we'll say that for later in the book of Acts. We're going to talk about that. Um, oh, that'll be a good week. Okay, so... But here's the thing is, is, is we don't determine God's will by casting lots. That was done the last time ever, should ever have happened in church history, ever, is when they picked Matthias. And they only to did it like that Judas. to yeah. replace Judas because they, the Holy Spirit hadn't been given to them yet. Right. Technically, they probably should have waited another day or two. <laughs> probably should have waited. I get it was a good intention. Yeah. Right? We don't have to cast lots anymore to determine God's will, to know his mind. We have the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about that in, in more in greater detail here. But here's the thing is our walk in Christ is not opportunistic. It's not opportunistic. It's not based on barriers or lack of barriers. Our walk with Christ is determined by the Holy Spirit who's taken up residence with us and in us, who shows us the will of the Father. That's our walk with Christ. It's not by opportunity. It's by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit who reveals the will of the Father, as Jesus said he would. That's how it works. So therefore, when obstacles or adversities rise up, it does not determine God's will. <sighs> who determines God's will? God. If you get nothing out of this whole thing, get that. Who determines God's will? God, that's it. That's the only person who determines God's will. Not your obstacle, not your adversity, not your situation, nothing. Not people, not actions of men, nothing. It's God. Now, can God give you an opportunity? Absolutely. Can God take away opportunity? Absolutely. But just the fact that you're given an opportunity doesn't mean it's God. And I always point this out as Adam and Eve had an opportunity in the garden. It was called eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was an opportunity, right? Let's talk, that was an opportunity. That was not God's opportunity for them. 
and they took it. So opportunity doesn't mean it's God. A lack of an opportunity doesn't mean it's God. The only thing that determines God's will, or the only thing that determines God's will is God, not adversity or opportunity, because adversity is going to come. Jesus said it was. He goes, in this world, you'll have troubles, but I've overcome it. Don't sweat it, but it's coming. It's coming. And the disciples here, they faced adversity, and it's not the last time. <laughs> it's not the last time. In fact, okay, let's just call it what it is. The church has not been without adversity since the day the Holy, since, since the, the day Jesus, Jesus was born. Yeah. And actually, we probably go Old Testament too, right? right? <laughs> Those who've walked according to God's calling have always walked in adversity. Why? Because we, we have an adversary who seeks to, he was a, he, he's a, <clears throat> he seeks to devour us, right? Because we're the heirs of salvation. We're the ones who receive the Father. There's a whole thing there. So what do, we, well, what do we need to do with all that? Well, we need to walk in wisdom. And it's interesting. So Glamel here. It's interesting he, he speaks up. The wisest sage of them all, right? The, the, the big the old man sage. Which at this time it sounds like he's probably pretty old because he referenced these other guys who have been around 30 years prior. So he's probably old. Or er. I don't know, but he's older. He's, a, he's old enough that people listen to him. Right? They're like, oh, why am I speaking? We've got to listen to this guy. Right? He may not be in charge, but he's really in charge. You know, he's that kind of guy. And he speaks up, and he basically points out this paradox, this paradox that they're facing, this conflicting set of circumstances. And he goes, if God is in these guys who are preaching in the temple, if God was with Jesus, we have a problem. And we might be fighting God's plan. And he points out the paradox and he goes, you guys better be careful here. Better be careful. And what he's saying here, he's saying, where is God? He's asking a question. He's, he's trying to get them to, to answer a question where is God in this? Is he with them or is he not with them? And basically, because all he does, is he points out the natural ramification. He goes, if they're not, don't worry about it. If he is, we have a problem. And that's why earlier he says, don't touch them because we don't know. Don't touch them. We don't know. See, when we face adversity and we face trying times, we need to know where God is. We need to know where he is. And so when we're facing adversity, what do we need to do? Well, here's a couple things we need to do. The first thing is this. We're facing adversity. We need to ask and look for God. Ask and look for God. What has he told you to do? If he's told you to do something and he hasn't told you not to do it, keep doing it. If God's told you to do something, you start facing adversity, and he says to do it again, keep doing it. The disciples were in the temple. They were preaching. They got arrested. They got broken out. And the angel says, go do it again. They were beaten. And they did not cease to teach every day in the temple and house to house. Now, notice that there. They did not get a secondary command after the angel told them. They were beaten. They didn't get another visitation from the Lord saying, go back to the temple. No, they went with the previous command because it's still in effect until they're told otherwise. So they, of course, they went back to the temple probably the very next day. Why? Because they probably had to get bandied up, eat some food. Let's say to tomorrow, right? The very next day, they went back in there to preach the gospel again. Because they're doing what he's told them to do. Jesus told them, he goes, go preach the gospel everywhere. Everywhere. And when we follow God's leadings, there will be challenges. I've quoted this verse a couple times here. Let's, let's, let's just read it here. John 16, 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. But in the world, you'll have tribulation. Take heart. I have overcome the world. How we handle adversity determines our finish. 
How we handle adversity determines our finish and determines whether or not we will keep going. It's not pleasant being beaten. I've not been beaten. My, I've never not been beaten for the gospel. I, and I'm glad. Right? But it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant being threatened. Yet when they left, they rejoiced because they were doing what God had said to do. See, when we're convinced of God's plan, it, <laughs> excuse me, it becomes, adversity becomes easier to handle because we know what we're doing is correct. We know what we're doing is on the right track. We're not ambiguous as to, was that obstacle from the Lord or was it not? No, because we're doing what God's told us to do and an obstacle comes up. God's not going to tell you to do something and give you an obstacle. That's stupid. That doesn't make sense. So if he's told you to do something, an obstacle comes up, you can, you know that's not from God. So now you got to deal with it. Now you got to deal with it. So when we're convinced of God's plan, adversity becomes easier to handle. And that's why you can't tell someone what to do. Right? Oftentimes, you know, as a pastor, is people come to me and ask me questions all the time. What should I do in this? And I go, I don't know. What should you do? Very rarely do I ever say, go do this. Why? Because I don't have to live with the consequences you do. And you have to be convinced of what he's called you to do. Because if you're doing what he's called you to do, guess what? There will be problems. And when problems occur, you better know who to blame. And it's not going to be me. You need to blame him. And you need to go back to him and talk it out with him and go, God, I told you to do, I, you told me to do this. And now there's adversity. That's where the conversation has to go. And that's why we can't t give people decisions like, oh, and go to the window. It doesn't work like that. And that's why we have to be convinced. And the disciples here in the book of Acts, and actually all the book of Acts, but they are convinced of what they're supposed to do. Jesus told them, they did it. They get arrested. They get busted out. And an angel says, hey, by the way, go back. And they continue to do it throughout the book of Acts until the end of, end of their life. Literally. Because when adversity happens, guys, you have to have God's will to stand on. That's what we stand on, what God has told us to do. God's will and his plan for your life when adversity happens, that's what we stand on, his will and his plan. The community question. <coughs> What scriptures, right, what scriptures, what scripture promises do you stand on or can we stand on when we're facing adversity? What scripture promises can we stand on when we're facing adversities? This is an important one. Let's talk about it. Bonus points if you give references.
All right, so when adversity happens, we need to ask and see where God is. The second one, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray about God's plan in that situation. How do we walk it out? God, I don't know what to do here. How should I walk it out? What should I do? We need to pray in the Spirit. We need to pray in our prayer language, right? Uh, Romans 8, 26, Likewise, when the Spirit helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us, with groaning is too deep for words. Jude 20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit till peace comes. Gotta pray. Pray with your words. Pray in English, right? Pray. Get it? Gotta pray. Not only that, but pray and fast. Sometimes you're gonna have to fast. What is fasting? Um, we gotta make sure we don't make fasting uh, whimsical, right? Fasting's not whimsical. Fasting's not whimsical. But we need we need to need to fast. What is fasting really? Fasting takes away the flesh, or what what the natural guy wants, right? The natural guy wants to eat a hamburger, right? It's fasting. But when we deny the natural man what he wants, it allows our spirit to assert itself and to communicate with God's spirit. It puts the natural guy in check. And the spirit asserts itself. The spirit comes alive and says, hey, let me talk. And it removes uh, obstacles. It removes distractions. That's what fasting does, right? Fasting is not manipulation. Oh, I'm manipulating God to do something. No, no, that's witchcraft. We'll talk about that later in the book of Acts, right? That's witchcraft again. That's not what we do. But fasting causes the natural man to quiet and the spirit man, because the natural man is now quiet, spirit asserts itself and says, hey, let's talk to God. That's how it works. So we need to fast. We need, to, we need time to talk and to hear with God. And third one, third one, we need to respond to God, right? So we ask to see where God is. We pray. Maybe even fast. We pray in the Spirit. And the third one, we respond to God. See, when we've done all that and we've asked God and we've talked to him, we respond to what he's communicated to us through prayer, through Scripture. We respond to it, right? So what did he communicate you to, you to do? Did he say to stay the course when it comes to adversity? Did he say change directions? Did he say um, tweak it? Or, in your prayer, did he communicate an understanding of what is happening that now leads to a specific prayer about the situation, and you get an understanding? So you have more knowledge, and you're like, oh, that's what's happening. It's almost like you get a dose of wisdom, if you will. And that may, maybe leads you to more prayer, right? Right? Maybe that leads you to counsel. That gives direction either way. We respond to what God has instructed us. See, and the whole thing is this. That's why God's given us his spirit. So it wouldn't just be with us, but it would be in us. It's the fundamental truth of the New Testament, guys. It's the greatest thing that, one of the greatest things that happened. As a matter of fact, it was the thing that Jesus was most excited about. He goes, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit can't come, but I really, 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 really want to stay. I, all through the book of John, he goes, the Holy Spirit's going to come. I really, he can't come till I go, but I want to stay. That's the fundamental truth, because the Holy Spirit wasn't just going to be with us, but in us. And that's what the disciples are drawing on. The indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. That's why they don't cast, that's why they weren't casting lots anymore. They didn't have to. The Holy Spirit was indwelling with them. That's why they didn't live life based on circumstances. The Holy Spirit was indwelling with them. Right? They didn't have to do that. They just inquired on the Holy Spirit what they want them to do. And then they would say phrases like, and actually we see in the very next chapter, it seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit. They didn't cast lots. They didn't do any of that. They're like, they prayed. God spoke, they responded. When we face adversity, we pray, God speaks, we respond. See, here's the thing is, um, Clamel, Gamel, he pointed out that they didn't want to fight against God. Don't want to fight against God. 
But the problem was, is the Jewish religious leaders never inquired what was God's will in the matter. They agreed, like, oh, that's pretty wise. We don't want to fight them. Bring the beating sticks. That's, that's their decision-making process. They decided, yeah, that was wise. That makes sense. Let's beat, this. Let's beat them senseless. <laughs> right? There was still a flaw in the logic because they never determined God's will in the matter. They just pointed out that, who knows what's happening here? Hmm, that's interesting. Let's beat him. Sorry, I'm making, making light of this, but that's, that's the thing. He goes, huh, beat him. They never determine God's will. <laughs> we as believers is, that's great. You see an obstacle. You realize it may not be from God. Great. If you don't pray through it, if you don't ask God how to deal with it, if you, don't, if you stop right there, you're, basically what you're saying is, go beat them. I'll just stay here. I don't want to answer. I don't want to deal with the adversity. I just want to hide. I'm going to hide behind it. I'm just going to stay right here. Basically, you're saying, go beat them. Doesn't make any sense. James chapter 1, uh, verse 5 here, um, and a little more. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all, who, or to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For if one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's tossed and driven by the wind, the person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Right? We need wisdom. We need wisdom. When you're facing a verse, you need wisdom. We can't jump to conclusions. We can't come to cliche pop culture theology. We need scriptures to, to, to call on. We need scriptures. We need to see God's will in the matter. We need to see this because we know this. is if that, if that barrier is God pointing us in another direction, we don't want to fight against God himself. But if it's a barrier, an obstacle that's been placed there by man or by the enemy, we need God to break through that, and we can't stop. We can't make that compromise. And so we have to determine, we have to know what God has called us to do. And so we need wisdom to know his will. We need to trust his will. And we need to figure out if that is a speed bump or is it a barrier. Yeah, I think about Jonah, right? He knew what God told him to do. He didn't want to do he it. He didn't want to do it, so he thought he could just escape the plan. But God put a Bad barrier, idea. huge barrier and speed bump in his plan to get away Don't and sent him to be the guys on the boat and, and helped to get him back on course. Right. And he and, still didn't want to do it. Yeah, but he did. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> he, he went through the motions. He did. And, he and, God, and God used it anyway. Right. And people repented and people were set free. If the spirit is leading you, you will be okay no matter what the adversity is if the spirit is leading you you'll be okay in this world you'll have troubles don't freak out i've overcome them if the spirit is leading you you'll be okay and in the process of adversity we draw on him and that's why the holy spirit is in us right so we look for god god where are you god what is going on here what is happening here? What do I need to know? We pray. We might even have to fast. And then whatever the Spirit conveys to us, we respond. Like, okay, here we go. All right. I know what to do. Whether it be knowledge, you understand what the adversity is, or whether it be a specific direction of God, it goes, go this way, go that way, go over it. Whatever that direction is, we respond to it. John 16, 3. 1633, I have said these things to you, that in me you would have peace, and in the world you'd have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. This is his promise to us. This is an absolute truth. Okay? Adversity will come. It's okay. It's okay. That adversity, that problem, has not determined God's will. God has determined his will, and we just need to know what he's told us to do. And for some of you right now that he's, he's already told you to do something and then adversity hit, unless he's told you something different, keep 
going. If you started a certain path and God hadn't told you one way or another and adversity happened, ask, God, what's happening here? What is this? I'll tell you. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask in faith, believing he receives and he'll get it. And if God, if God conveys a correction to you, then do it. But you'll be okay. You'll be okay. So in our communities, let's, let's, take, let's take some time here and let's pray for each other to know God's will and to have the strength to stand for God's plan when adversity hits and when speed bumps start occurring. We're like, oh, speed bump or barrier? What is that? That's what we're talking about. Because adversity isn't going to stop us from God's plan. It's not. And we just need wisdom to know what his plan is and ask him. So, Lord, we come right now, Father, and we just ask for wisdom. Holy Spirit, show us what is your plan for life. Father, in the adversity that's come up, reveal, help us discern what is going on, Father. Make it clear to us. And if you told us to do it, we will do that very thing. Thank you, Father, that you've overcome the world and because of that, we have peace even though adversity happens. In Jesus' name, amen.